How's everybody doing? Good. That's a little better than last night. They were like sleepy Saturday. So sometimes it's sleepy Sunday and I don't know what I'm walking into. But it's a privilege to be with you here. I've known Paul and Harvest for a lot of years. I started ministry in Calvary Chapel as a 20 year old kid. Uh, I think I, I hung in there as a kid till about 34, 35. That was about 15 years of the pummeling of Jesus. Uh, you know, I, I was known as a guy with passion that hasn't gone anywhere, but that passion, I've got a dog here on my hat. Here we go. God bless you guys. Um, so I was a, a young pastor known with passion and I got a doctorate probably by like 18. You ever, ever met one of those kids? It was not a good doctorate. It was called a doctorate in confrontation. I tell people not to go to school for that. Uh, and so I was really good at slicing and dicing and using the word to correct uh, before I could have compassion. So the last 15 or first 15 years of ministry was a lot of work of God just building compassion, uh, allowing me to enter pain and then learn how to limp so that passion could be used in a way that would be profitable for the kingdom. And I, I really believe that without pain, um, most of us won't get to do the very simple things that Jesus asked us to do without hurting people greatly. And so for me, my story is that I got called to be a pastor at 14 and then went through many years of, of doing sweet things, beautiful things, getting to travel the world, share Jesus with my wife and kids and move to Maine as missionaries and plant churches and replant churches. But in the midst of a lot of that was God's work of shaping and humbling through pain. And if you were part of those seasons, you know that. And I, I just want to say thank you for the grace to allow me the space to, to grow, because we need that. Somebody said, you know, at, near the end of their life, they said, what, 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 what would you have done differently? They said, I would have um, doubled down on God's forgiveness and mercy, because everybody is carrying so much already. I would have just given more forgiveness and more mercy away. And I'll tell you, we don't know what each other are carrying, but I can, I can say this, more forgiveness and more mercy will go a long way in the simple, beautiful things of Jesus. Amen. So here's the deal. This map is our platform. We created a map about 21 years ago. We rebuilt it two years ago. You can't see what I see uh, unless you have really great vision. I don't, except for when there's dog hair on my hat. There's over four or 500 homes asking for us to show up as the followers of Jesus just in Fort Wayne, but this is open to the whole world. They just don't know that yet. And our dream is that neighbors everywhere would be sent and served. There would be a people that would be following the simple way of Jesus. I think in the West, we could maybe agree together, maybe we won't, that we've kind of missed the basic commands of Jesus. Staying close to his love, loving him with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Loving one another, the body of Christ, and loving our neighbor as ourself. And I've kind of made it my aim and ambition that I'm going to double down on the simple things of Jesus and not waste time on things I don't understand. And so my invitation to you as the bride of Christ in Fort Wayne, Indiana, through this local church of Harvest, is that you would either be encouraged to continue on or be mobilized to get started in the way of Jesus. Because there's a dream that we have, and it's this, and by the way, there'll be a few slides that I didn't spell right because now technology spells for us and I don't know how to spell anymore. So that's also a God bless you. But what if there was a movement of ordinary Jesus followers who made it their aim or their ambition to be with Jesus to become like Jesus and actually do what Jesus did? What if one of the results was on this platform, just in the Fort Wayne area, that there'd be no neighbors need every year? No neighbors in need at the end of every year. What would, what would be said about Jesus? What would be said about his church, his kingdom, the people that say they follow him? I think we're known for far worse uh, in our area and all around the world. And so this is the dream. Be with Jesus, become like Jesus, and do what Jesus did. And maybe, just maybe, the things that I see every day that I can't fix, the things that you see every day that we can't fix, would be sorted and solved. My contention is we all have this dream, but we're just waiting for pastors and politicians to sort it for us, rather than the people of Jesus following Jesus into the things that sort those kinds of things. Does that make sense? So, 
this is going to be a quick ride full of a lot of information. You're going to like just get torched right now with information. I encourage you to write down what the Spirit says. But before I talk more, what I ask you to do is put your hands out in front of you. And we're going to do this together. And we're just going to say, come Holy Spirit. You can say that out loud too. That's cool. But we're actually just going to put ourselves in a posture where our hands are wide open, our hearts are ready, our ears are available. As I pray that you would quietly, you can say it out loud like we're chanting somewhere, but um, I appreciate that. I wasn't expecting it, so I'm shocked. But hands open, even between the spaces of our fingers, we're yours. So Father, I thank you for my friends those that I haven't met, your family of God. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come in a way and uh, teach your church. Jesus, you said it would be better for you to go than for you to stay, that the Comforter would come and he would teach us Jesus and remind us of truth. Comfort us in the ways that we need to be comforted. Empower us with gifts. Bear fruit out of our lives. And that your kingdom would come and your will would be done. Lord, we are not ours. We're yours. And you're ours. So I pray for soft hearts, open ears, receptive uh, lives, and your glory to be done in all things. May I be captivated by your word and empowered by your spirit. In Jesus' name, everybody said. Amen. So a few things. To be with Jesus in Acts chapter 4, 13, after the Holy Spirit had fallen, people had been going out and dispersing through the streets. John and Peter had given the gospel. A man is healed in Acts 3. The religious cats of the day, I have a bonic problem, so bear with me with words you don't understand. You'll just look them up on Google. And uh, so this man gets healed. They're beating him, saying, don't talk about Jesus anymore. And they say, nope, we can't do that. And what these religious, well-intended, really smart people said, man, these guys have been with Jesus. That was the indicator that, that something really crazy was happening. Is It wasn't that they were smart or educated or that they had done a perfect job. It was that they simply had been with him and they could be seen and it could be shared. It could be uh, told that these, these fellas had spent a different time with a different person and had done something different in their life. In Jesus' final words, we'll get this to a second, in the upper room conversation of John 13 through 17, he was saying, hey, come be close to my heart for you. That's where life happens. And so I, I also say this, whatever I'm telling you is what I need for myself. I have been a doer all, almost all of my life. I, I like doing the things of Jesus. It's been hard to learn to be with Jesus. Some of us, it's easier to be, it's hard to do. All of it's part of the story of the kingdom. Does that make sense? Two, become like Jesus. Jesus invites us to deny ourselves. that when we come after him, to deny ourselves, to take up our cross and to follow him. There is an apprenticeship, a discipleship in following Jesus that we would actually become more like him by laying down our life. My wife and I sat with the Lord's prayer just yesterday at noon. We laid our hands out on the table outside in our backyard and we prayed this prayer and then we got to the place, your kingdom come, your will be done and we started weeping. I'm not sure I've ever prayed that prayer and meant it. Confessionally right now. It's easy to repeat that, but when we actually say with our open hands before the Lord, your will be done, that's, that's different. That means everything is yes for you, Lord. What you ask of me, yes. I'm not saying we're going to do it perfectly. The goal is faithfully, faithfully wrestle with the things of Jesus. There is much room for you and me to stumble our way home. Thirdly, to do what Jesus did. I think I missed this first part. I kind of got wrapped up in like, you'll do greater works than, than me. And I was like, yo, that's a little crazy. That's charismatic. That's Pentecostal. You know, I'd been sabotaged to read the scriptures and undermine what Jesus said. But the first thing he said was, you'll do what I do. You're going to do what I do. And so that's my aim and my ambition today. More than neighbor link. 
is that there would be a simple message laid before you where we would be with him, become like him, and by God's grace, we'd actually do what he did. So the first thing is our aim. I know this is a little different. We're not going through a specific text, but bear with me. I, I am an expository teacher, but when I have a specific message, I'm all over the place to tell that story. So our aim, uh, uh, the older pastor retired now said to me long ago and far away that the closer we get to Jesus, the closer we get to one another. Who or what is your aim today? Who or what is your aim today? What do you think about it? I think in our country and specifically in the Midwest, we have competing kingdoms and identities at work. Paul would say, it's only Jesus. Him and him crucified is all I've got. The most intelligent man in probably the, you know, the last 2,000 years, the most educated, the most uh, passionate, I just want to know Jesus. I want to know him from his, his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension. I just want to be about Jesus. I can leave all this other stuff behind. Even more in Philippians 3, which is, this is just so crazy. This man goes, you know what? In light of Jesus, bear with me because this is going to be offensive uh, to some of us. In light of Jesus, I lay down my nation, I lay down my tribe, I lay down my family, I, I lay down my education, I lay down my job before you, I lay down my zeal before you. All are on the table because you are all I want. I count it all as rubbish for the gain of Christ. I lay it all before you. There is no room for us to, to worship a nation that we love and we're thankful for despite our king. There is no room for the lefts and rights to be at war in the kingdom. There is no room to be obsessed with my rights and my freedom in the kingdom because he says, come and die. Come and die to follow me. That is where you'll find joy. That is where you'll find life. That is where you'll find abundance. When you come and die, you lay it all on the table, hands open. That is life. And that is abundance. Brothers and sisters, for too long, we've been fighting a different war. We're trying to get in America that Christ is not calling us to get. He's calling us to be captivated with his mission. The messianic mission of Christ that's been going on for all of history. That he's coming for hearts through his people all the way home. And he says, hey, there is no I have no willingness to compete with other kingdoms or idols. So would you lay them before me and count them as loss because I'm worth it? I'm not anti-American. I'm not anti-politics. I just think when we're waiting for the wrong hero, his name is Jesus. And if you're fighting this season for your policy or your politic, I ask you, to lay it down and then keep laying it down every time you want to fight. America is not going to get better fighting for America. And it won't even get better trying to get Christian policy into politics. Do you know what will happen? The people of God live as the people of God. In whatever nation they live in. The first century Christian was a part of a Roman culture that was liberal out of, out of whack at all levels. Weird, Christianity flourished. Just because this place is changing doesn't mean Christianity is threatened. I think we are made for fire. I think we're not only made for fire, but we're made to flourish in fire. So if you're fearful, if you're afraid, bring those to your Savior. He loves to entertain your doubts, your fears, your worries, your confusion, the generations, all the stuff, our kids, all that. Bring it, bring it there. But the best foot forward is putting our eyes on Jesus and not looking anywhere else. 
Secondly, abiding. Abiding, uh, Jesus says in John 15 that, uh, hey, I've loved you like the fathers love me. So would you stay close to that love? As I've defined it, would you stay close to me? He later says, as we do that and obey him, that it would bring joy into our lives. I'm asking you today to double down on your belief that through abiding unto obedience, because he's already made you new, that he's going to produce joy in your life. Living a different way than the kingdom of this world calls us to live. Some ways to practice is getting quiet. My friend says, a thousand, if you get quiet and you're like, man, my mind wanders. You can imagine what my mind does when I get quiet. I'm like, dog hair. Um, <laughs> write this down. This guy's name's Rich Viotis. He says, a thousand distractions are a thousand opportunities to come back to Christ. Don't beat yourself up if you're distracted. That's called humanity. Take it as an opportunity to be drawn back. Uh, a long time ago, Francis Chan said, when somebody understands the gospel and they sin or they fail, they fall short, you can tell if they believe the gospel by what they do with their sin. Do they run and hide like the garden or do they run to the cross? My encouragement to you is in solitude, run to him and keep running, running back to him. You can even sit there. I pray, I pray things like, I'm here, you're here, you're here with me. We're here together. I pray things like, Holy Spirit, come. I want to hear what you have to say to me as, as your church, as part of your church. You can sit and just and slow down. Get in the scriptures as led by the Spirit. Memorizing scripture outside of the Spirit, they are not intention, they are companions. Just like grace and truth aren't at war, the Spirit and the scriptures aren't at war. The enemy would like us to believe that they're at war, they are not at war. The scriptures and the spirit are necessary for one another. And so when you, when you come before the Lord and you get in his word, even again, Holy Spirit, please teach me what you say to the church through the scriptures that have been given to us for the last several thousand years. Supplication, bring your prayers to him. Listen to him. Bring your prayers. Maybe solitude is listening. Uh, supplication is bringing. Both matter. They're inter-exchangeable. You can do both. You can do one. Either way, come before the Lord and throw your, your requests and your needs and your petitions to the Lord. And then Sabbath. A lot of people have different views on this. For many years, I didn't know where my Sabbath was as a pastor. Uh, I just couldn't find it. Life was too busy. I wasn't just a teacher. I was also a people guy. I was a shepherd. So I was teaching and then I was with people. And sometimes it was bananas. Quite frankly, our house was like a rotating, you know, college university dorm and uh, young kids that were uh, in, in broken homes living in our extra rooms and it was bananas. And so I had no boundary to keep my own insanity in my abiding. There was no way out. And so Sabbath, I would say it's, you know, Jesus has our Sabbath He's our rest, Hebrews 4, John 8, and I would move through the scriptures like my rest is sufficiently found in Jesus. And yet there's a day that's been given for us to rest and trust that six days is better than seven days. That God can do more with my life in six than in seven. Entrepreneurs, listen to me. You think by seven days of plowing hard, you're going to do more, but you're going to wear out, burn out and fall apart. And you're not trusting Jesus with your rest. Additionally, Sabbath doesn't have to be like this stoic thing where I'm stiff, like we're in Old Testament law and I can't move. Like I can only take so many steps a day, you know, like that's not what he's saying. He's like, hey, come to me, find your rest, pick up the proper yoke freshly that I can carry you and help you walk this, this life out. And additionally, do things that bring you rest do things with your family or friends that bring you joy, relationships that are joyful. Maybe do work that you don't have to do on that day, stuff that recharges your battery. Get around a table with peers or fellow brothers and sisters and celebrate over the meal, over a feast that the Lord is our rest. Maybe, maybe bring those things back in, in one piece at a time. 
So solitude and scriptures and supplication and Sabbath are a few ways to abide because abide, quite frankly, is too abstract for our Western mind. I don't have a list of things to do, but these are options to either add in or move around. And there is no law here where I am trying to be heavy. I'm just trying to be helpful. Third, abounding. I believe in abiding that love will overflow. I believe that we are going to be people that are fruit of the spirit. Your gifts, your work, your talents, your hobbies are nothing in comparison to bearing the fruit of the spirit. Listen, listen again to that. We can do all the things in the world. We can move mountains, we can do miracles, we can preach sermons, and they are nothing if we do not have the fruit of the spirit starting with love. Nothing. Rather, I believe the fruit of the Spirit through abiding is meant to be produced through my work that was given to me before the foundation of the world to walk in, Ephesians 2, 10. Additionally, in through my gifts, in through my talents, in through my hobbies, the fruit is supposed to be born and others are supposed to taste and see that the Lord is good. That's how I'm trying to live. I'm going to stay close to you. You're going to bear fruit out of me through my work, through my gifts, through my talents, in my hobbies, and in that place, people will taste that you're who you say you are. Uh, I was, you know, younger, like 35, <laughs> and uh, now I'm 45, so like I, I really walk with a limp. And um, I went to, you know, you can judge me. I'm cool with that. Uh, I went to a cigar lounge with some friends up in Maine. And I'm sitting around a table and um, they're all unbelievers except for one friend. And I'm sitting like, why am I here? And, and if you know me, you know that I find myself in those places quite often. And I don't know why I'm asking why I'm here anymore, quite frankly. But I still ask that question. Like, what, what am I doing with my life? I'm sitting at a cigar shop in South Portland, Maine with some guys that want to talk about whatever and what what are you doing lord why am i here and i just hear shut up i was like cool he goes i love these people more than you do if you stop talking and start listening i'll bring them i'll bring myself up through their through their own words 30 seconds later this guy's like hey man how do we get here who made us what's the purpose of life and i was like yo Two years later, he was born again. A whole bunch of other people ministered to him. Worship leader in New York City. My friends, the, the fruit of love through listening could do wonders. Again, I told you earlier on, I was a fixer and a corrector. None of those made real change. They led to condemnation. But the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit will change the world. Paul says this over and over again. And my prayer for you is Ephesians 3, 17 through 19. He says there's four-dimensional love in the kingdom. We know three-dimensional love. Sometimes we live in two-dimensional love. Sometimes we don't know what love is. He goes, I want you to understand the fullness of God's love, the height, the width, the depth, and the length. I want you to be overwhelmed by this love. I want you to be transformed by this love. A buddy uh, last week said something to the effect that we have only tasted in drops the ocean of the love of God. We've only tasted in drops the ocean of love that is available to us. But those few drops, may they produce a hunger and thirst for the taste. May they transition our, our hearts and our minds for the things of the kingdom. Additionally, this love, bless you, is supposed to um, transition into loving one another, like I said. I believe this is our best evangelism, which is why I think the enemy is exploiting our love for each other. Hear me. I really believe, and you can check me on this, our best evangelism is our love for one another. Because when the world sees reciprocal love, giving and receiving, love, back and forth, that was reflective of the Father's love for the Son and the Trinity and their beautiful dance together of perfect love. When they see this in people, they go, oh, there they are. Those are the followers of Jesus. Interesting, right? 
Sometimes we think our best evangelism is having the right scriptures to say or the right thing to say or the right sermon to hear, but the best evidence, there's probably a few of them, but one of the best evidences is our love for one another. <clears throat> I have a contention that I believe uh, from my experience in church planting and even in Fort Wayne that most of the church plants and replants, not all of them, God bless this one that's going down to Rudisil. A lot of them are, hap they happen because of hurt. They happen because of pain, be uh, division. I can do it better. And so the motivation often isn't pure like what you guys are walking through so beautifully. A lot of it is we just can't get along. We can do it better. I remember meeting with a church planter up in Maine. We came with some ideas, but mainly we're gonna follow Jesus into the city and we were doing church services together. And <clears throat> as we did those church services together, I was like, why don't we just do it together all the way? Like, I didn't come here for my thing. I don't think you came here for your thing. I'll lay down my ideas and then lay them before the Lord with you. And we'll see what he does together. This could be beautiful. Couldn't do it. We have brands and buildings and budgets and ideas that, that take hostage the call to love one another. And why I would say this is really crazy is the verse before this, verse 34. He says, I have a new command for you. I never saw that till five years ago. I lumped that in with love my neighbor as myself. But the new command is new. And it's the glue between loving God and loving my neighbor. I actually believe that most people don't have one another in relationships, which why they don't neighbor. They don't have the fuel to love other people because they don't have this reciprocal giving and receiving in relationship. My, my brothers and sisters, find some people, a few people that you can do life with where you give and receive. You don't just give or receive, you give and receive. I don't care what age you are, I don't care where, what state or season you are in life. If you have that, it will lead you to more worship. It will lead you to more neighboring. I promise. And if we don't love that one as much, he also calls us to love uh, our neighbor as ourselves, which I would define as pr uh, proximity, presence with patience. Loving my neighbor without expectations is I'm being close to you with who I am and I'm doing it patiently. My wife used to, she jokes about this, she used to do evangelism and, and go try to reach people in our neighborhood off a of crescent when we lived back here in Fort Wayne. And she would give people three months to come to Jesus. She's like, yo, if they don't get this stuff straight, I'm out. I was like, babe, I don't think that's the way the kingdom works. She's like, but that's how I'm going to do it. And we moved up to Maine and she realized the slow, steady, patient walk with someone often is where Jesus moves best. Most of us are here is because somebody walked with us over time or people, multiple people walked with us over time. And then here we are today as new people. Years ago, I, I walked into a tattoo shop. I actually was anti-tattoos 20 years ago, which is really funny. I was like, babe, I think we're in trouble if we get tattoos on our body. And she's like, I'm going to get one. And, and I was like, okay, you're going to get in trouble for that one. And then like two years later, I looked like an Etch-a-Sketch. If you know what an Etch-a-Sketch is, God bless you. I love you more. It just makes me feel, feel closer to you. If you don't know what that is, just pull out your phone and do cool things. And you can like do a lot of cool things that you don't have to do this with. And so, um, so I walk into this tattoo shop and this huge man, he's like 6'6", blood tattooed here, missing teeth, long hair, huge. He walks in and, he's, and he walks up to me and he's like, hey, what's up, man? And I'm like, My buddy wants to get some Hebrew on the back of his arm. I think I'm gonna do it with him. He's like, cool, so we get this all set up and uh, we go into his little shop, uh, his little room, and we start talking. I ask a lot of questions. I want to know people. As I ask questions, they often go places that I wasn't anticipating, and I don't think they were anticipating. And something like this came out of his mouth, and I'm just going to say it truthfully. I'm not sugarcoating this. He said, black people are the missing link of evolution. And I was like, you're stupid. And I said it. I also thought that I might die that day. And then I said, I'm going to give you some stuff to read. I'll come back in a week and we'll talk more. This is one of many times where my wife thought I wasn't coming home. And so um, 
<laughs> so I, I, I come back, give him some stuff, go on a, a trip with some kids from our church, come back a week later, and his girlfriend and him walk out of the shop when they see us pull in. They get on their knees, and they're like, Jesus is right, we're wrong. Would you start a Bible study on Monday nights? We'll shut down early. We want to hear more about this man that you talk about. On the right, my other new friend, Ryan, my, my friend Ryan would not come to the Bible study. He would just tattoo inappropriate things on very, very not clothed people in the room to the right. And then eventually he's like, hey, would you sit in my chair? I want to tattoo you. And I just decided that day that my skin was less important than people. And so we started making friends. Passion of the Christ came out at that time. If you know what that is, I love you also. And uh, so we go to the movie theater like people used to do. And we go in there and, you know, and we sit down and he's like, I really want to see this because it's going to be really beautiful scenery, blood and all this. I'm like, okay, that's funny. And uh, we sit there and the lashing scene starts going on and he walks out in a sprint. He's pacing the hallway. And I was like, man, what's up? He's like, that man met me in my dreams last night and told me I needed to follow him. I was like, cool. (laughs) I wasn't ready for that. And, uh, we start walking together. He runs away from Jesus nine months ago, he, uh, 10 months ago. He gets aggressive cancer. I'm back in town. I said, hey, can I come and visit you as he's doing chemo uh, and really uh, going through a hard spot? I sit next to his bed in the hospital. We hadn't talked in probably five or six years. And as I sat with him, the Lord brought us back together and I was able to walk him all the way home in June. I have so many stories based on the next point that I haven't gotten to yet. Just look around. Some cool stuff will happen. So being with Christ, abiding in the love of Christ produces the fruit of the Spirit. Man, I can't, I can't uh, overvalue this. Fruit of the Spirit on display on the streets of Fort Wayne, Indiana, in the homes of Fort Wayne, Indiana, in the neighborhoods, in the workplaces, in the schools, in the churches, is what we need most. Additionally, becoming like Jesus, the fruit of the Spirit, this is where I couldn't spell, right? Is meant to be tasted through our work, gifts, and talents by one another and our neighbors. I just challenge you to double down on believing that he gave you stuff to do, and he gave you the fruit to do it with, and to be energized by being close to him, and that will be enough for everyday, ordinary life. Being aware and available. Doing what Jesus did is becoming aware and available to uh, the spirit in my everyday, ordinary life. The people I bump into, those couple stories I just used. I wanna give you a couple ideas. Jesus' every day was like my normal day. People cry out to him, come to him, we're brought to him, you pass by him. Some people feel you all out of the way. John 4, the woman at the well, recline with or be next to. My brothers and sisters, as you abide, as you abound with the fruit, that we would be a, a people that begin to become aware to those that we bump into. <clears throat> One last story before we kind of land this this plane Uh, two and a half years ago three years ago I was really in a hurry to get some coffee before a meeting you ever been in that spot where you're like I need that coffee it's like it's like gold nuggets to my soul right now and so (laughs) I pulled over on the side of the road I have a really big truck uh, it has six inch lift. I have short legs, so I have to hop out of the truck. It's really embarrassing. People think I have issue with my self-esteem because of that truck. And so, um, so I jump out, I jump out and I begin to walk towards this coffee shop. And as I walk towards this coffee shop, a black woman from a block away goes, hey, Mr. Neighborlink, get over here. I was like, yo, what is happening? So I walk over there. Her name's Castella Mack. She goes, hey, I've got stage four pancreatic cancer. I was given three months to live. I'm still here flourishing in Jesus. We're going to be friends. Can you come to my house and fix it all? I was like, yes, ma'am. <laughs> Castell had a really hard early life, a lot of family pain, a lot of isolation, a lot of ostracization, but Jesus did a work in her. 
And so we painted her house. My father-in-law, Chuck, who played bass today, went over and fixed a water heater and people began to come around her and she began to call me son. Went from a stranger to a neighbor, to a friend, to like family. She began answering phones at NeighborLink and uh, taking in requests for those in need in the city of Fort Wayne. And when you would get uh, on the phone with her, the sweetest but most straightforward woman you'd ever heard, she's like, honey, we ain't doing that for you. You know, we ain't, we ain't messing with you like that. And we ain't, no, no, you're not gonna, no, you're not gonna pull one over me. Have you done this yet? And she, she, would, she was like, I love you and I'm gonna help you at the same time. And uh, the cancer began to grow. The treatments weren't working anymore. And so I got pulled in to walking with them in her final days and hours, all from somebody who yelled at me on the side of the road. It was really interesting. One day I brought protein and water because she hadn't been eating or drinking. And so I, I hurried up and went to Kroger and I came in with two bushelfuls of what they needed. And I came to the front door and knocked on the front door. They opened the door, one of her daughters. And when she looked at me, she's like, who are you? I said, I'm Eric. She's like, no, you're not. Eric's black. <laughs> we don't have white brothers. And I was like, nope, I'm Eric. She's like, man, mom should have told me. <laughs> and so I walk in there and then got to be close with those two and three ladies for the next several months. I wish I could tell you all the stories, but it really comes from just trying to do what Jesus did. It's not me. I have a certain makeup that leans towards this, but I think it's for the sake of the church's edification, encouragement. That my crazy life of being available would, would allow you to go, what, what is my part to play? What's my piece? Who are the people that I bump into in my everyday ordinary life? And so apply. I, I'll post this later. I'll have the church post this later. I'll give them the link for all these slides. But what I would encourage you to do is think right now and start praying about the five or six neighbors that are around you or people that you bump into. Do you know their names? And could you just start praying for them by name? Know their names and start praying for, their, for them by name. And then look for ways to practically serve. I think in the West, we used to hand out bottles of water for evangelism. Like, hey, you love Jesus, don't, don't you? Got some everlasting water. If you're like, you spiked that sauce, what are you doing? You know, people didn't trust when we do things because they weren't asking for them. It was good heart, wrong application. What about early first century, people were healed and born again because of their specific needs. They'd been waiting for years for someone to show up. What if we started responding to specific needs? And you might say, man, what if they don't come to Jesus? Man, Jesus is real patient with people. He's in pursuit of them. If it doesn't happen, it's not on you. Our job is to go. His job is to save. Then we go have a new job description called discipleship. Some of us are trying to save people when we've just been told to go and the spirit will save. Give the job back. Serve them practically. I know there's a lot of reasons why not, but I would ask you to treat people like Jesus treats you. You can come up with excuses. They're going to take advantage of me. They're not thankful. They won't come to church. They, they aren't going to become born. You can say all the things you want, but Jesus pursued you without any expectation. He showered you with love and waited for you to respond. Let's treat people like we're treated. Not just how we want to be treated, but how we are treated by the king of this kingdom. And then maybe extend to your other neighborhoods, your kids' hobbies, your hobbies, where you love to spend your time, who you love to spend your time with. Look for ways to, to take names, start praying, look for specific need. And then maybe go somewhere where you haven't thought about going before, like a woman at a well that was countercultural at the time. Go to a people in a place that maybe is off the side. But when you go, be led by the spirit. Listen first. Speak second, pray without ceasing. We talk too much. You know that I talk too much. Serve practically. Share and show, this is, this is big for me. Share and show Jesus, not your preferences. Central things versus peripheral things. Jesus, everything else. Uh, there's a verse that doesn't seem like it would be that helpful. Deuteronomy 29, 29. Please write that down. 
It says this, the secret things belong to the Lord. That saved a man that wanted to be right. I was, I was trying to convince people to believe me about things that had not been clarified in the scriptures yet. So the secret things belong to the Lord. That led me to worship. Lord, you're good. I wonder, I don't know. I bring it to you, but I'm not going to fight about those things. Colossians 1, 26 through 27 answers the second part, which says this, this, the things that he's revealed belong to us and our children's children's children. Colossians 1, 26, 27 says, the mystery revealed is Christ in us, the hope of glory. I think that's the only mystery really revealed. You're not on a schedule. Not everyone will receive you. It's really hard. I don't like it, but it'll be okay. Practice, become disciplined, keep doing it. And then here's my invitation to you. Kind of. Pick up this dream. Let's pick it up as a whole church in a whole city and see Jesus do something crazy. Pray about it. Take a picture of it. Sit on it. Ask the Spirit to prompt you, whether down on Ruta Soul, in your home, uh, around here, wherever you are. Would you just, I think it's the dream of Jesus. He wants us to be with him. He wants us to become like him. And he wants us to do things that he did. And maybe, just maybe, when we do that, this platform wouldn't look like it does every year for 21 years. I don't, I don't carry this burden, and I'm not asking you to carry it. I ask you to pray about this. How in 400, there's 400 churches and 2,900 nonprofits in Fort Wayne. Three billion dollars a year go to good things. You can't address darkness from distance. Money will not solve the problems that plague us. Even good sermons won't sort this stuff out. Our presence will through the spirit. So I ask you to, to do one of these three things. If you need help, you text that number or hit that QR code and you just simply ask for help. Become vulnerable, even embarrass yourself and ask for someone to show up. Church, if you're the second group that you have, you have talents either from the basic, I can mow lawn, I can sit with someone, I can paint, I can build a ramp, I can help, I have a business that I can do HVAC or roofs or bathroom remodel. I had a woman ask, say, hey, can you, can you put a new bathroom in? I haven't been to the shower in three years because of my disability. She's been wiped down for three years because she, she's not having an accessible house. We do about 100 ramps a year. That's great. We can get you in and out of your house. But what if you're isolated and ostracized in your own home? Well, I want people to have a joyful existence in their home. Lastly, we have a small budget and do crazy things. And I'd, I'd ask you to pray about how you can come alongside us. Our, our, my crazy prayer in the next uh, six weeks is $400,000. A little over $100,000 has come in. I know that's crazy and there's a lot of people talking about money. I don't pursue money. I actually, as a pastor, had a really hard time talking about it. I didn't know what to do because of how it's been abusive. But when you do that, you're helping our staff mobilize and connect neighbors with neighbors. And really what we're trying to do is roofs, furnaces, hang out with matriarchs, and lastly, <clears throat> uh, make accessible bathrooms and houses for people that are in disability. Because the least of these in Luke 4, 18 and 19 is who Jesus has asked us to pursue. He actually says that's who we are. I know that's a lot. Whatever part, whatever piece, I'd ask you, to respond simply, one step, one piece, one part, one day at a time. My, my brother and the president of NeighborLink, he, I said, man, how do you do all this stuff? You're just everywhere doing so much in your life. And he's like, I just believe that God will give me everything I need for life and godliness today. I'm not asking you to change the world. I'm not asking you to, to go out and just run, run yourself ragged, be with Jesus, become like Jesus, do what Jesus did. And maybe this dream... We'll get to uh, enjoy it together. Amen? Amen? Can you put your hands out? Holy Spirit, would you come minister to my brothers and sisters and the pieces and parts that are for them to carry? Would they respond? Would I respond? I need you so bad. We need you so bad. Will we respond and step with your spirit for the name of the one and only King? 
Would your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven today? In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. amen. God bless you guys.